Gig Gab, episode 388 for Wednesday, July 5th, 2023. Greetings, folks. And welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include capoapp.com, which is our, our, it's our app that gives us song learning superpowers. You're going to want to hear about this, and we will talk more about it in a little bit. For now, uh, fresh off of the holiday weekend here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. I'm here actually right now in Santa Cruz, California. It's Paul Kent. Amazing. What are you doing in Santa Cruz, Mr. Kent? <laughs> I'm hanging out here. You know, I'm visiting my daughter and my grandson. And Santa Cruz is awesome, by the way. Yeah. I, and in fact, today, I think we, it would be good to talk about Santa Cruz's music scene and how it's slightly different from Silicon Valley's music scene, which is just 20 minutes away. So, you know, close tw- proximity. 20 minutes over the hill, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, Sure. You've been playing gigs up there uh, in in the the Bay Area, Santa Cruz ish area over the weekend. Um, last weekend, well, let's see what what day is it today. No, <laughs> so, so we played a Fourth of July gig. House Rockers had a really great Fourth of July gig up in a town called Moraga, California. One of those you know civic fireworks yep. all day things. That, you know, and it was it was really good. You nice. know, we I, as I've been saying to you and you know on the show, we we're playing just so much less. Until this week, actually, because we're playing five times this week. But oh. um, yeah, uh, we're playing so much less that I worry about the distances between gigs. Sure. And then I'm just stunned, you know, when it's like butter again. And, and again, having having Russ being able to sub for us now and knowing our show and being as great a preparer as he is has made the world a difference. And so, you know, we're kind of getting through this weird summer, you know, of, of you know, our, our spacing out of gigs and, you know, our drummer having some health issues and sure. having to have a, a sub drummer. So anyway, a whole bunch of weird stuff, but it, we just played a great 4th of July gig. It Amazing. That's great. Flowed, you know, the guy, it, it felt like it had that chemistry that, you know, feels to me whenever we take long breaks, it, it's a little harder. It's a little harder to, I don't, I mean, actually it's not harder. I just am always worried it's not going to be there when we start to play. And then always so delighted when it is there when we play. I wonder if if part of that worry is, is helps fuel the, the the sort of the awareness. Like I, I I find if I and and generally if the band hits the stage too confident, like you know you just played a bunch of gigs, everybody's kind of you know a little worn out, or maybe you played a bunch of gigs and then you've had a week off and and everybody's like, oh well, we just did this a bunch, like it's going to be fine. And then there's just some sloppy mistakes because nobody's uh, on a high alert, right? Whereas if you haven't played for a little while or you're not playing as much, then you go into these gigs a little bit like, well, we're not playing as much. I hope everybody's listening and I hope all of that. And and it tends to feel that sometimes. I don't know. So, sometimes that can work. Yeah. yeah. We, um, no, I, I get it. And that's really it is like not knowing, not knowing where everybody's head is and interpret like as a leader, I'm trying to keep everybody on the same page, keep sure. everybody motivated, focused. And as, as I've shared with you, you know, some of the guys are getting into other things. Nick has a Zappa thing, Simon and, and Mike have filled the time with, you know, a developing solo career. Mm-hmm. And it's funny cause I was talking to Nick about this, right. And Nick, you know, is great at splashing cold water on me. And he was like, remember, you're the one who told everybody you're moving <laughs> the plan is X and that everybody should fill the time. Yeah. And so we have, and I do have to check myself, but, it, but it's not so much, it's not so much that people are filling the time. It's how it feels about what they bring to the, to the house rock. Sure. So I, I think I was somewhat naive in thinking that people can really different people have different abilities to, to do both. Right. Like some people are intensely linear and you know, they, they really can only do one thing at a time. And that shows if you ask them to, to juggle multiple projects, some sure. people are really good at multiple projects. So it's a moving target of emotion as to whether this thing that was this bro club for so long is going to maintain that feel. 
And it comes and goes, actually. I don't, I don't think we yeah. know what we want to be in this next kind of incarnation of the band with, with people having different things, you know, going on. So uh, I can see that. I, yeah. I, yeah. It just, it just comes and goes. I don't think we've, I don't think we've grown in 25 year history of the band. I don't think we've grown into what this next chapter is going to be. If it's going to be playing somewhat less and, you know, guys, cause I said to Nick, you know, I wouldn't have hired so-and-so if he was playing 25 times a month, you know, I don't want someone that busy that I have to bid for their time, them not be available. If something comes up, that's a good thing for us. Sure. I mean, that, that wouldn't be, I wouldn't hire a guy like that. And he's like, well, you didn't hire a guy like that. Yeah, you, you know, you hired a guy who wasn't available. And then you told him to go out and fill the stuff. And then you so. go told him to be a guy like that. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, fair. Yeah, yeah. N- N- Nick is really good at in a, in a you know, we're going to have Nick on the show, right? Yeah, I think he's coming on next week. Yeah, yeah. Next week. And yeah. Nick is really, really good of holding a mirror up to me and, and reminding me to check myself sometimes because, you know, good. You, you know, it's all about me all the time, right? That's 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 what I've I never noticed. I've never noticed. I, you, I, 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 don't, I disagree. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of me, no, um, we. Uh, what, what do you think of me? What do I think of you? I is it, no, isn't that the joke? Is enough the about joke? me? Enough about me. Well, what enough do you about think me. Of Let's me. talk about you yeah. exactly. <laughs> I love it. Um, we, uh, we, we when I say we, I should say, I should. I articulate which band I mean, uh, bitter pill has played once a weekend for the past three weekends, which for us is sort of, it, it's a lot. That's, that's sort of a heavier schedule for us. The first two weekends, which I think started right after we had Billy uh, on the show, Billy Butler on the show here. We, we did a, a show out in Manchester with where we opened up for this band horsefly gulch. And then we went to Concord, New Hampshire, which is a, a different town north of Manchester, both like sort of halfway across the state, uh, where we we did sort of the same thing, uh, opening for the same band. And we had th- those gigs were good. Um, we used their gear, so I played on their drums. We used their backline for the most part, and and that went that part went fine. It, it was okay. Um, certainly makes logistics simpler and, and it was fine. And they're nice guys and all of that, which obviously makes life much, much better. But we were using the house sound. And in both cases, the engineer wanted to mix my ears. And I like it never, you never, I never get what I want when that happens. And, and it's just a different board. And so gains are set differently and everything's a little bit, it's just different. You know, it was fine. I was able to hear what I needed to hear to get through the gigs and it was all fine. And we played really well, especially the second gig we showed up and it's this place called area 23 in Concord. I'd never been there before. Never even heard of this place other than seeing that some bands played there. You pull in, we played there, and I think it was on a Friday night, pull in, and it's like a, sort of an industrial complex. It's like not quite a strip mall, but it like on the front of it is like a yoga studio and maybe some offices or whatever. And I'm like, oh no, like what was this club this morning? Like, was it, it are we about to walk into some, you know, vibeless warehouse that just echoes and has no soul, right? You know, it's like, okay, whatever. And then I drive around the back and I see the door of this place. And it's like, again, the whole building is just brick and very corporate and all this, except this one door that has like, you know, holiday lights all over it and like lava lamps and beer signs. And it's like, oh, wait a minute, there might be something to this. You know, and we open it up and it's, it's like a roadhouse in there. It's like, well, how did this place, how did they get approved to do this? Like, how have they not been thrown out of here? And it was a great little room. The people that were there were great. It was like salt of the earth kind of a crowd, which I love because they're just into it for the music and they're there for the vibe. And uh, band played really well. And it, it went great. It, like they really went great. And that gig especially was a surprise. Like I just, I'm shocked. And then this Sunday, uh, sorry, this Saturday, four day weekend, it all blurs together. Uh, <laughs> we played... An out an outdoor gig uh, in the afternoon on Saturday. We, this place near us that uh, it's called Hackmatack. For the past fifty years or whatever, it has been a theater, musical theater. I, and I played shows there. I think I did Dirty Rotten Scoundrels there years ago. Uh, they closed it last year, 
only for the kids of the 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 family who closed it to sort of take over ownership and open it back up. And they're doing different things. They are doing theater shows this year, which is great. But they are also doing things like they did on Saturday, which was this Farm Day Jubilee. We didn't play in the theater. We played on the porch of the theater. They had set up chairs and a tent uh, or a covering for people out in the sun because it was our one sunny day in the middle of like monsoon season here. And uh, and they had the whole farm open. They had, you know, uh, bison burgers and apple pie or blueberry pie, whatever, and and beer and farm animals. And they were like, it was just like farm day and a bunch of bluegrass bands played. And, uh, all right, Paul's back. We lost Paul for a second, but anyway, we played this, um, this, this, uh, right. You're back, Paul. Yeah. I'm here. Amazing. So we, we played on this porch there and they had their own limited PA, but we knew it was limited coming in. So we brought our own stuff. Uh, we used their mains and just wired into their mains with our mixer and ran our own sound and set up our own monitors and all of that stuff. And we played two sets, so it made it worth it to bring, uh, you know, th- th- that kind of gear in. And man, it just, it makes such a difference when we're, when we sound like we sound to us, y- you yeah. know, where it's yeah. just us and everything is like yep i i know this this is how we normally are this is the reverb we usually use we're used to hearing that these are the delays we use it's used to hearing that these are the gains we use like all of those things make such a difference i you know i put my ears on after we got everything set up we couldn't make any noise while we were setting up because there was a totally acoustic bluegrass band playing (laughs) kind of in the field without any amplification And so we had to be, you know, respectful of that and quiet. And I put my ears in and just like, you know, said something softly into my microphone. It was like, yeah, there's, that's the sound. That's what I've been missing, you know, for the last couple of weeks. And, uh, you can't, you can't discount the value of being comfortable when you play. No, I know. I I love our mixer. That Mackie DL 32 S is, is it's, it, we just, we have it dialed in and it, it works great. It sounds good. It's just. But yeah, you're right. You can't discount that. I I agree. It was um, it was fantastic. And and it was interesting when we were setting up. I was thinking about this afterwards. When we were setting up, it was a, a on the porch of this uh, this barn. It was a very wide porch. It wasn't too shallow, but it was certainly much wider than it was shallow. And I was like, well, we could set the drums up upstage center, which is kind of our normal setup. Uh, you know, it's sort of the default in a lot of clubs. It's how, you know, things are set up if there's a drum riser there or whatever. So we typically do that. But it was like, you know, I don't need to be right on top of you guys. If if you don't want to have me right here, I can go and be stage left and just face sideways. And uh, it was like, let's just take advantage of, of more room. And so we did that. And it was interesting. You know, I, I've always thought I like that better because I can see my bandmates better when I'm uh, stage left as opposed to upstage. But the reality is I can always see my bandmates, like no matter what from the drum set, especially, you know, up upstage center, I have a perfect view of everybody. I can see who's walking to a microphone when, or who's like, if a guitar player is walking up to, to punch a sure. pedal, to take a solo, I have eyes on all of that. Like I, I get to see everything all the time. So me being up center or, or stage left, doesn't change that for me what it changes is it potentially changes is it changes everybody else's ability to see me and i noticed with bitter pill it doesn't matter because everybody in that band is paying attention and communicating all the time like i wouldn't say that we're i would never describe bitter pill as a jam band right but we have we have developed our own uh improvisational style or, or improvisational etiquette maybe is a better word to, to use. It's really sort of rooted in, in bluegrass, uh, you know, and jazz is kind of where that comes from for us. Uh, but where everybody's just listening, everybody knows what's going on. If there's a soloist playing, everybody's paying attention to what's going to happen next. Like there's, it's, it's super rare that anybody on stage in that band is not aware of everything that's happening on stage. And and that means logistically, but also musically, like everybody's listening, everybody's either reacting or staying out of the way or, you know, making choices based on what other people are doing. And 
But how how can it not be that way for anybody? I mean, I, and before you answer that, yeah, go ahead. Well, we're gonna have Nick on next week, and you know, Nick has put together this fourteen piece Zappa band, which I went to see. Yeah, the show. I saw some early rehearsals, and then I went to see a full show. They actually are came on tour through the town that I'm living in. Oh, nice! And I went to see it, and it was just it was just a fantastic show. But it's Zappa stuff, and it's still I don't know Zappa music very well. It's it's dense. It's it's complicated. There's a lot of time signature changes. There's a lot of field changes. It covers a wide spectrum of everything from orchestral to yeah. you know rap. You know, feels it's just all over the place. Zap is all but, over the place. Yes, <laughs> but all fourteen of these people were absolutely focused on not just playing these you know incredibly complex parts, but on what was happening on stage all the time. So yeah. you're, it's interesting. You're saying this as though you know we have this thing. I would say the house rockers to a great degree have this thing. I mean, we know a lot of the stuff that we've been playing for years. We don't, we don't have to wonder who's going to take the solo here or anything like that. I mean, it's not like that, Yeah. but shouldn't always be performing mean, always be focused on the group performance and, you know, it, invested and engaged in everything that's going on on your stage. I, I, I believe so. I wish that were always so. And, and, and perhaps we're talking about degrees of, of something here, but it takes a band time to develop that level of all of those things, the communication, the awareness, the listening, the trust that everyone else on stage is paying attention the same as, as you are right. Like that. And it, it doesn't happen with every band. I like, I I've been on stage with bands where it's like, you know, well, it's not my turn to solo. So I'm just going to like chill out here for a little bit and not, you know, just kind of, zone out a little bit i i mean i've seen it i've i'm like i said i'm watching all the time <laughs> so it, yeah so this is this is the always be performing thing right i like agree it's not just yeah it doesn't mean doesn't mean always be dancing around uncontrollably and make the attention to you <laughs> it means right. be part of the team as you are as you are performing together and like i said i just still don't know the zappa music i was totally engaged yes in the in the connection that this band had you know emoting music that I knew nothing about that made me really interested in it because they were, I, you know, they were I, I think performing as a unit, right? Yeah. 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 And, and they were doing it so well. I wanted to be up there. I mean, I wanted to feel that thing as close as I could feel it. Cause it was so joyous. It was so, it was so right, you know, and, and maybe not for every style of music. Joyous is it. I mean, if you're playing death right. metal, I don't know if it's joyous that you're going for, but I mean, you're if, em if, emoting something together. Yes. You, yes. And it's the power of that, together that makes a performance go. And I as think, we've said many times, live music is a visual art as much as it is a, a, a musical audio audible art. No, I think so, you're onto something here. I, I think because people do come to see bitter pill and, and they are every time we play, we gain new fans. Right. And I think part of it, of course, is just the music, but that's only a part of it. And with just the music, it wouldn't be enough. It's that yeah. performance of it. And and like you said, it's not the performance that means everybody's bouncing off the wall all the time. It's the, I'm excited about what my bandmates are doing. And if you happen to catch what I'm doing, that's hopefully going to be infectious to you. Cause I'm not checked out. Even if all I'm quote unquote, all I'm doing is playing like a little two beat or something behind whatever's going on that's the right thing to play in those moments. And so that's what I play. And I'm, I like, I'm happy to play that. It's, it's like, it's what I would want to play in those moments to support it. It could be a boring thing, right. Or, or, you know, a, a sax player that just stands there and is, isn't playing. So therefore, you know, isn't quote unquote, part of the music. You can absolutely be part of the music just by paying attention to what your bandmates are doing. And that, in, that excitement is going to, or that interest is going to be infectious. I remember the first time I saw Bela Fleck and the Fleck tones, like back in the nineties, uh, four piece band. I knew, you know, I, I had their record. I, I knew, I thought I knew what I was going to see. Right. And, and to a degree, I knew what I was going to see. I mean, they played, you know, that crazy, like progressive bluegrass, whatever you want to describe it as, you mm -hmm. know, crazy bluegrass music. But when any of them would take a solo, they were all, uh, the, the, you know, Bela and Victor Wooten, of course, Bela on banjo, Victor on bass, future man on his drum guitar. So he, the, the three of them were standing and then there would be Howard Levy stage, right? Uh, usually sitting behind his piano facing the band. So stage, right. Facing across the stage 
or standing up playing harmonica. Anytime any of them took a solo, the other two or three that were standing would turn and watch that person. And it was very choreographed. Like the first time it happened, it was like sort of funny. It was like, oh, look, that's a little shtick. That's because it was your shtick. But it communicated what you should be paying attention to as an audience member. Right. And it showed that there was something interesting happening over here that maybe you want to watch, too. You want to join us and do this thing. Like you said, I want to be on stage. Well, you can't because they throw you off. You know, that would be bad. You get thrown out of the club. But this, the next best thing you can do is join the attention that they are giving on stage. But if they're not giving that, then it sort of encourages you as an audience member to check out too. No, I think you're onto something. I, I think there's, that's, this is huge. This might, this, this might be the sort of the epitome of always be performing. Don't you think? Right. I think, I think it's the essence of it. Yeah. It's the, yes, it is the essence of it. Love it. All right. Our sponsor for today is super mega ultra groovy. The folks behind Capo, which as you know, is our go-to app for learning music by ear. Without Capo, it's super frustrating, right? Music and video players make it hard to move around a song or find exactly the right spot that you want to hear. And if you can change the playback speed, it sounds terrible. Well, this is where Capo comes in. It gives you song learning superpowers for precise listening. You can use Capo's transcription playhead to tackle solos in bite-sized chunks. And when you slow down your songs, even at a quarter speed, they still sound great. That's because Capo was built using high-end studio quality audio stretching technology. But I've barely scratched the surface, right? Capo also lifts chords, detects beats, and so much more. So here's the best part. Capo gives you all these tools completely free. Yup. There's no account to create, no ads, and no sneaky trial subscriptions. You have nothing to lose. Head to capoapp.com or search for Capo in the app store to download it for your Mac, your iPad, or your iPhone. Again, that's Capo by Super Mega Ultra Groovy. C-A-P-O-A-P-P dot com. And our thanks to Capo for sponsoring this episode. So uh, right before we recorded here, I spent about the last hour uh, sitting behind my drums. We were supposed to have fling rehearsal tonight, but some schedules got screwed up, so we did not. And I figured, well... I am behind again uh, in my responsibilities to record some drum tracks for the next EP of Fling Songs. And so I tackled one of them today, this song called Rasputin, which is, I think this song is older than my children. I only became aware of it recently, but I think Russ and Aaron wrote it uh, I, like, you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago or something, maybe even longer when they were in a band in college. But uh, it's like this, it's this disco kind of like Nile Rodgers chic sort of vibe to it. And so it requires simplicity and precision. Uh, I, at least that's how I'm approaching the, the drum part in this. And it's like things have, things have got to be like in the right places. Of course, because it's a fling song and especially because uh, Russ is the one who sets up like the bass tracks. Russ will set up some scratch tracks for me. Then I put the drums down and then everything gets, sort of gets built around that. Um, Russ and I, especially in Fling, we tend to play ahead of the beat. So it's this thing that's very precise and precisely ahead of the beat consistently throughout the song. So it was really an interesting exercise getting this down and getting the groove right and getting everything right. I think I played it uh, like six times and um, which is sort of my that's that's sort of my my plan is I just sit down and I play the song through as many times as I can until Either I feel like I've really nailed it or it starts getting worse. And then I know, all right, well, at least for today I'm done. But can I hack together something from those X number of takes? And usually it's three or four takes. But today, once I got through take four, uh, that's when I started feeling comfortable. And I was like, all right, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just try one. And it's been, uh, so I think I played, what, 22 minutes of 116 beats per minute. Uh, oh. Right. Well, I mean, that's what it, because I don't get up. I finish the track you know, rewind the, the tape to the, to the beginning. I mean, the, the tape, I rewind logic to the beginning and I hit record again and off, I off to the races. Like I just sit there and played pretty much straight 116 beats per minute for, you know, 20, whatever it is, 23 minutes, six times, 
3.75, whatever that works out to be. So, <laughs> um, but it, 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 like, I'm curious to see how this one comes together. It's a different vibe for us, sort of. I mean, it's, it sounds like fling, but it, it's a, you know, it's kind of a different thing and having some fun playing it, you know, very simple and precise and just trying to like lock it all in together. So I'm, I'm curious to see how we, how we pull yeah. it together. Yeah. It, like when we'll, did you, when can you play it for us? Oh man. Um, well, it, it'll probably be, I would say four to six weeks before all the parts or enough of the parts are together where it's like, yeah, we can play it here on the show. You know, um, th- this right. is, this was literally the first chances are nothing from the scratch track will survive to the final uh, cut. So what I recorded today, assuming what I played survives and it, it may not, you know, somebody else in the band might be like, nah, no, 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 no. You got to change this or do that or whatever. And then I'll, I'll retake it. But, um, assuming what I recorded today survives, this will probably be the first thing that is part of that track. So yeah, it usually takes us at the time we record all the instruments, get all the vocals down and lock it in. It takes a little bit, but who knows? It could come together quickly. I don't know. Sometimes they do. All right, well, yeah. We'll hold you to it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll, I'll play it on the show as soon as, uh, as soon as we have a mix that's close. So yeah, I like to, yep. I like to debut. Well, good. It's fun. Yeah. 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 Hey, so I've been thinking, you know, I've been waving this, this flag for a long time about, you know, how musicians can, should support each other and, and make, make your scene a viable economic scene for yeah. musicians. Right. Yeah. I think I'm giving, I think I'm about to quit. Oh. I just, <laughs> Wait, you, you're, well, gonna, you're not you know, quitting music. You're just quitting the, the waving of this particular flag. The carrying of the flag. The yeah. Carrying. I mean, there I, you go. Yeah. over and over and over, I see you know, musicians of all calibers, including, you know, experienced musicians. Sure. Taking what I would consider poopy gigs, you know, because it's a gig, right? It just happens over and over and over again. And and I I rarely see the, the two times that I've publicly said, hey, this venue did a bad thing, you know, I've had musicians say to me, Oh, that's awful. We will never play that. And they take a gig there right away. I mean I just <laughs> they take your, your just empty think, slot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I you know, I, I mostly have have been saying that it's the it's the amateur musicians who just want to gig for the sake of showing off and they undercut the pay but it's not just the amateur musicians huh. it's 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 musicians of all experiences who are like and maybe they maybe even the experienced ones have gotten to this point before and have said listen i'm tired of fighting the fight you know i like to play you know the market is telling us what they'll pay i'm not going to affect the market you know if it's a hundred buck gig it's a hundred buck gig yeah i know that's what we got in the 70s but I I definitely have found, and I, I say this because, as I said at the top of the show, I'm spending more time in the Santa Cruz area now, yeah. and it's just a very different scene, and it's also different economics. Now, in Silicon Valley, you know, there are like really expensive wine bars and and you know places that it costs a lot to be a patron of. Sure, I don't, and there's actually one very Rodeo Drive like shopping center beautiful i think i saw you play there it's crazy does not pay musicians i i played there under a series that got me paid but 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 when the shopping center you know has run this you know music in the past it's tips only and i was like this is like you know every name brand rodeo drive type of store how do they not have the money to pay even a modest amount to musicians but I know very good musicians who go, yeah, I get, but I can get four or 500 bucks in tips. It's absolutely worth it. And I'm like, but is there a principle here that we should worry about? And they're like, I don't, I don't eat off a of principle if I'm making four or 500, if, as long as it's consistent and I know it. But again, I just think this, this market economics, like being, being the guy trying to change that is a totally thankful job. Now over here in the Santa Cruz area where I am, um, it's just different. It's not the same economics. It's not, you know, super expensive wine bars and that type of thing. And there's a lot of musicians over here. It's close to the ocean. It's a really nice area. And um, it pays less. Um, there's a lot of asking for musicians to do free gigs. And I don't even, I don't even think free is, is a barrier of no anymore. I mean, I, I see name musicians that I know 
taking free gigs as a chance to get in with a booker to do, you know, to do better gigs. So sure. I don't know. I, I just am kind of reflecting on it now and it just seems like an impossible, the only way that you can control cost is if you have the leverage because you're bringing so many people and you know that a place is going to make money. So if you've done the work to build yourself an audience, then you can probably write your ticket as to where you want to play. You know, if you're, if you're going to, if you know the money and you know that those people are going to tip you and you know that the restaurant's going to be glad about it. And then maybe, you know, there's, there's a certain degree of making relationships with the venues and you know, that type of thing. But by and large, it's not just the, the weekend warrior guys that are bringing, holding the scale down. I think it's just kind of the hopelessness of the situation that even really talented, experienced musicians are like, listen, I can't affect this, right? Yeah. I, it, I mean, the market is speaking. It is paying what it'll pay. And if I don't take it, they'll give it to somebody else. And, you know, at the end of the day, what, what, what is the issue? And, but there are places that, that I play that really respect music and musicians, and they ask, what is your fee? That's always super interesting to me. As opposed to it, in where I am in the Central Coast, they ask that a lot more. In Silicon Valley, they say this is what it pays, and often it's not a, not a great number. And, and again, Silicon Valley is a way more way more well healed area. So I don't know. It's just a reflection I was going to share that the 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 money fight is a is a tough one to keep your spirits up in. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean it. The economics of any given scenario or any given locale are, I mean, it, it, you know, moving that needle is, is going to be tough. I, as you were describing the shopping mall that play that only lets people collect tips and doesn't pay them anything. I was reminded of Nashville. Now, most Nashville clubs, as I understand it, please correct us if we're wrong on this feedback at giggabpodcast.com. I've, I've never played in Nashville, but the Nashville musicians that I've talked with who play the sort of touristy bars, they do get a little something from the bar, but the majority of their pay comes from tips, but they are making tons of money in tips, right? Like it, the, the, they are supporting themselves quite well that way. So, you know, like, the model works and it's consistent. The model works and it's consistent. Correct. Yeah. So like, is that, is that how it quote unquote should be? I don't know, you know, but it's how it is. It's how it be. And that's kind of how it's, you know, how it's been there for a while. And I don't think it's going to change. So, um, music has value. Yeah. Yeah. Music has value and, and it's okay to ask for that value. I like, I, th yes. I, I think that that hasn't changed, uh, you know, and if, if the scenario that like tips are not a bad thing and maybe, maybe there's, there's something in this, like asking for tips is if that's how the economics of that particular gig works, well then, you know, let people know that it's, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, music has value and the smart people know how to frame the system for them. And what I mean by that is, the other thing you can do to make yourself earn better is so if one is having having an audience that you bring to public gigs, the other thing is having a a reputation and having scarcity, not a lot of availability. Those things seem to make people want to pay you more. Yes. You know, so for as for corporate gigs and for privates, right? So if you're if you are who they want, usually there's less dickering about money do you agree with that uh, yes of course yeah yeah that makes sense yeah yeah, so yeah. Sca scarcity helps as well so scarcity helps but yeah the general you know monday through thursday you know public gig stuff is crazy i mean like i said there's there's a restaurants where the bands come and set up on the floor i mean it's just it looks like a very unsatisfying experience for the band and for the patrons but it's a gig and i've played a lot of places where i've set up on the floor like that's not, I, I know, I know what you're saying. If you're used to setting up on stages and all of that, it's a different experience, but I've played some fantastic gigs where I set up on the floor and it's totally fine. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but I've also played some awful gigs where I've set up on the floor, right? I've played some awful gigs where I set up on stage too. It, it really depends on the vibe of the room 
And it might be the vibe of the room in general, or it might be the vibe of the room on any given night. It depends, right? My po- my point is, it. Uh, I've never heard of a gig having a hard time finding someone to play it, regardless of stage, floor, huh. or, or fee. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know anyone, if they want to offer live music, that can't, that has a, any problem finding people to take a gig. That's a really interesting observation. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you? Um, I've, I've heard of clubs having trouble r- rarely if there, there are the exceptions to the rule, but there's always a reason for this, right? Like they've, they, they, they don't know what they're doing. They don't, uh, clubs that don't pay enough wind up turning all the local bands off. Like I have seen that happen where it's like, okay, well, all? like really all. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking of one. Club. Not like what you would consider like a second tier band that would never have gotten yeah, that gig, and maybe, and, maybe. and then all of a sudden, yeah, maybe. yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, yeah somebody, I'm, I'm you're just right. Somebody's tonight, but. no, somebody's willing to play. You're not wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's how it be. The, the key is the key is to kind of harness the forces of nature in your favor, right? Like again, scarcity. You know have a following, um, be something unique. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's business. You know, you make money. I just got a, a Bob left sets thing. That is this hysterical. He, he's, he starts out. He says a banker and a techie can never be a rock star because they don't play music. That's how far we've come. A term that used to mean something has been bastardized to the point. Now, that if you know the original meaning, yeah. How awful that bankers and rock stars, we want to refer to them as uh, bankers and techies want to refer to them as rock stars. Yeah. Present company accepted, of course. Of course. That's right. Well, we also yeah. play music though. That's the difference. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. Anyway. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, left sets is he's, he, he is incendiary by design. Uh, he he likes to rile people up and pr- and prolific and prolific. Uh, yes, those things are true about him. One thing that is not true about him, or th- that is also true about him, is that he is not an editor. He writes stream of consciousness and clicks send. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. good. Like he he writes well enough. He, he clearly he knows how to write. He also probably knows how to edit. He just doesn't care to. He just blasts it out and he's fine. He's an attorney, right? Yeah, I I don't think he practices anymore. Um, but but he certainly you know he was that that was his he went to school to be an attorney and and wound up I I don't I don't I actually don't know his history. We're talking about Bob Lefsetz, who publishes a website uh or and and a the the website and the newsletter are the same thing. It's the Lefsetz letter, and it's it comes out what three to 18 times a week, depending on Bob's prolificness that week. (laughs) And, uh, and he just rants about all kinds of things, but what's really things mostly related to the music industry, but he also happens to be a fan and watcher of Apple. So like, clearly there's an affinity for, for, you know, your hosts here uh, with, with this guy, right? Cause we, we sort of think in the same worlds. And uh, and he will relate things that Apple does to things that happen in the music industry when there are those things that you know that that, that are analogous or whatever. But um, but the audience, I don't know how many people he has subscribed to his new newsletter. It's big, uh, but the audience is made up of people you don't know, and then there's people that you kind of know, like me and Paul, and then there's like Elton John. Um, and right. and Bob loves. Well, what he does is yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, well, what he does is often he'll 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 send out a newsletter about whatever topic, and then if he gets enough responses to it, he'll he'll share the responses along with the name of the person, the actual cut and paste of the response. And you'll go through these, and there'll be many people that you do know yeah. that clearly are reading his newsletter. So fascinating. But you know, I, I was actually thinking as you were saying that about Apple, he writes about a lot of things. I think his Uber perspective is kind of like how the world works. Like it like is. Yeah. The reason, I, yeah. the reason rock and roll became rock and roll 
is because there was a no BS industry and people were counterculture and that counterculture, you know, resonated with an audience of people who needed that. And I think that's the lens that a lot of stuff he does. I mean, he, he likes Apple because they're a success, but because they know how to harness their success and communicate their success. Yeah. I, I think that's more his angle is like, maybe like, he likes apples because they're is, the rock stars of the tech world. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Yeah. yeah. I think he, I think he likes just the truth of why things, why authentic things resonate in the world and why inauthentic things do or don't, you know, I, like, I highly we'll recommend the, the whole. Yeah. If you haven't yeah. turned off this show at this point, go subscribe to the left sets letter. We'll put a link in the show notes. It, it is fascinating. He is not afraid to peel back the onion and just expose anything. And the Ticketmaster thing that he really dug into was fascinating uh, over the last. Well, I mean, he understands that world really well. Really well. He understands. The, he's promoted the events. concert business. Yeah. 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 Right. And he yeah. knows no, it's that a great read. It's just too often. It shows up in your inbox yeah. too many times. Yeah. And so I've unsubscribed as many times, you know, <laughs> at least three or four times just because he wanted to turn it off. Right. I, I, I don't think I've ever unsubscribed, but I, I have no issue looking at the headline and just hitting delete. And if, yeah. but it, in fact, that's my default is I just hit delete. And uh, sometimes if I see a topic that's, you know, when it's like, Oh, that's of interest to me. I'll dig in or whatever, like the ticket master thing or whatever. And, and then when he posts his replies, I will scan through the replies looking for like, okay, what did somebody whose name we know say, you know? And, and sometimes what's funny is sometimes I'll see like a friend's name in there and I'll be like, what the heck is Matt doing? You read the left sets letter. He's like, of course I do. You know? And it's like, oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's cool. You know, whatever. But, um, it's a good read. It's it, it, occasionally it's a good read. It, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta titrate your own dosage of this. Cause Bob is just going to turn on the fire hose. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So like I said, we have, um, we played the 4th of July. I have tonight off. Nice. House Rockers, the 6th. Solo Gig, the 7th. House Rockers, the 8th, 9th, and 10th. No, wow. 8th and 9th. Wow. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. if anything is going to get us back to being tight and in flow, and then we've got, you know, a busy rest of this month and a busy next month, and then it, and it tails off a little bit, but, you know, we should be good and in, in, in flow for September. And then it'll, it'll, it'll tail down. And I'm just trying to figure out, and it's, it's going to be something I'm going to talk about on the show quite a bit. What do I, what, what are the house rockers going to be when they grow up? They're 25 years old now. And <laughs> you know, they're going to have to figure out. And hopefully they um, never grow it's up. Interesting. Well, you know, in one way we got to grow up in other yeah, ways yeah, we got to yeah. stay young and foolish, but uh, we're, I feel like I, I, I'm so inconsistent. Remember we had that conversation where I said, you know what? It doesn't matter. You do not need to change your set list. People don't remember it from show to show. And now today I'm like, you know, we're playing some music right now because we're in the sub drummer situation, kind of a safe set right now, yep. but it's going over really well and nobody seems to care. Of course. But sometimes I look around and I think the band seems to care mm -hmm. sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. in, in certain situations. Absolutely. In other situations when people are loving the music, they don't seem to care. So keeping your band fresh, is that an important thing? I think. I think it is, but I've been also known to think it's not. I mean, get a good show and you can ride a good show for a really long time. I know when I send out, I used to do, use this tactic when, when sending out rebook notices. So I'd, I'd, you know, at the end of the summer, I'd, I'd contact all the festivals and the concert series that we played. And I was like, hey, you guys were signed up on with us. Uh, you guys get first choice at our dates for next year, same date that you had for next year. And good news we'll be preparing an all new show for next year, thinking that was something that would catch their eyes. That they sure. would be, I don't think that resonated they don't at care. all. No, they don't I, care. I don't no. care. They don't care. They don't care. They don't care. I, I will say um, it, on the, on the subject of set lists, I have been uh, publishing the set list for every bitter pill and fling show on setlist.fm. And it's it's a fun exercise for me to to go back after the show and and put it all in there and and you know link it all together, uh, but I like I have heard from a few people who are like oh that was like I went and saw you you know last weekend and you published you know you you put your set list out there and so I went and looked at that and then I wound up looking at set lists for your previous shows and it it gives your fans something to interact with. Right. Not only yeah. does is it a nice sort of thing for you to log or whatever, like you know, there there is that, and I I really do enjoy the process of of going through and sort of looking at 
what the written set list was versus what we played. And sometimes I have to check with my bandmates like, ah, I know we skipped a song or we screwed something up or we changed something. What was that? You know, and they'll tell me like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, but it, it's it's been fun. Um, and it, I, I really think it, you know, it's another touch point for your audience, especially as you start to build up a history of these things and they, they have something where they get home from the gig, they're excited. You, you know, they just saw your band for the first time or the 10th time, whatever. And now they can sort of keep with that. They, they can tug on a thread uh, from that excitement and go a little deeper. And then maybe they'll go and like, you know, come to your next show or they'll buy your merch or whatever. Right. Like it's just, I don't know. It's something. So if you're not doing it, try it. It's I, I think it's really, I I've had a lot of fun with it. And uh, it makes sense to me because, um, again, I was really critical about, about how Facebook is a, my timeline is come to my show, come to my show, come to my show. And I couldn't imagine that it's a good experience for fans, right? right? Right, right. And I asked that, and I asked that question, and overwhelmingly, they were like, "No, love it." You know, I, I don't have to do anything. It's just something I, I noticed. And but finding ways to use social media different ways. When how often do you post? Because what what irks me is here's where I'm playing. Here's five pictures of me playing that gig. Yep. Here's a follow up gig thanking everybody by name who came. To my gig. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. And and bragging about what an awesome gig. Like every week, it's the same thing. Every gig you do is awesome. To me, it just seems disingenuous. But find different ways to talk to your audience. Like sometimes it's a sometimes it's a video. Sometimes yeah. it might be just a few seconds from rehearsal. A set list is certainly an interesting thing. Give people something to think about you, just to keep you you in their mind. I think that's a smart strategy for social media. But running the same play week after week, gig after gig, I'm going to be playing. Here's a midweek reminder. I'm going to be playing. Yeah. Here's tonight. I'm going to be playing. I just it think becomes, I it, just, it becomes an act of desperation. It, well, it's numbing, but yes. it can also be perceived as desperation, uh, it, it, depending on how you position it. But like you said, if you just keep mixing it up a little bit, throw a set list out, throw a video out. Like you said, the rehearsal video, I, it, Emily mainly, I think it's Emily and, and Billy, but but Emily mainly is the one who manages our socials in, in bitter pill. And she does a killer job, you know, just she, and because she'll think about these things. Like we'll be rehearsing and she'll be like, oh, yeah, I don't want to set up the camera again or whatever. And she just uses her phone and it doesn't sound spectacular, but it's okay. It's just, it's that, like in the right doses, that's actually a good thing. It's like, Oh, look at this, yep. this raw little footage. Oh man, that's a cool little, I want to hear that song live or whatever. Like, it's something it makes your like when Davis Thurston was on the show, he talked about making your band seem bigger than you are. And one way to do that is to keep putting out material. Even when people aren't, even when you're not playing a show for people to attend, you can give right. them something and it doesn't well, always have to be thoughts. beg me to come to your show. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, so two final thoughts. Remember we had this kind of like epiphany moment where I was telling you that guy that I like Springsteen has said, you know, I'm a fan of his, right? Who's this guy? I, I, you know, his song was, I think he, he, he had a song that was on the radio this past weekend. He was, uh, yeah. he's kind of a big deal. He's a big deal. Yeah. 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 Anyway. So, you know, he framed it as his whole career is about an ongoing conversation with his audience. Yes. And that as long as he approached it like that, that's one of the things that's enabled him to go off and play different types of music and try different mm -hmm. things. And, and, uh, anyway, so, so a conversation with your audience, if you look at your, your email efforts, your social media efforts, you know, everything it, it takes a different context yeah would you want the someone to have the exact same conversation with you day after day after day week after week no you wouldn't want that so that's one no, thing, in fact, thing if, if you come and tell me hey man I, I have this thing to tell you and you start in with a story that i've heard before or i do the same to you we're going to stop each other like uh hey I, I, you told me that story i've already heard that yeah, yeah. okay cool so the, the other thing is, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so the my last point is nick is coming on the show next week i'm yeah. really excited so same. nick is my house rocker buddy it's going to be a great conversation for his original well not original his zappa project they're actually going to go to a patreon model and so i was talking about what what are you going to offer for that and he goes well and so he has really interesting thoughts about that so Again, all these types of things for your real fans. If they're real fans, would they be willing to pay you one, five, ten, twenty, a hundred dollars a month for these types of things? If it's you know at a you know a, a usable frequency, yep. 
harder for a cover band, right? Because it's not really original art, which I think is what well, happens. You, you have less, you have to embrace scarcity in a different way with a cover band. Uh, yeah. my, my friend, John McCormick, who is our guitar player in Bitter Pill, uh, he has been in original bands all his life, but he also plays in cover bands, but not one of them is what I would call a typical cover band. It would be interesting to have him on. He and I were having this conversation in the car on the way to actually to that area 23 gig a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he's got a really good perspective on how to, how to differentiate yourself. So maybe we, we'll, That'd be fun. we'll make, we'll make 2023 the year of our bandmates. <laughs> we'll just start stringing around. It. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Stinkfoot orchestra right, so is also on setlist.fm folks. So, you know, you can yes. find them there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Nick will be with us next week and I'm looking forward to that conversation. You Same. know, Nick, we're a long time as well. well. So yeah. it'll be, it'll be really fun. And, um, uh, it, it, I'm looking forward to talking to my friend in this way. Cause I've been saving up, Questions from I just saw him. We went, we did this gig on Fourth of July. I just saw him for the first time after seeing his Stinkfoot project, I and I had a ton of questions, and I held several questions back because I'll be asking him in the interview when we Great. when we have him on the show. So yeah. Great. Anyway, good stuff. Cool, fun stuff, folks. Thanks for hanging out with us. We are, of course, reachable at if you want to continue the conversation with us. Feedback at giggabpodcast dot com. And uh, we'd love to hear from you because it really is a conversation with all of us. It's not us with you. It's all of us. We're all us together. Pay attention to your bandmates. It's going to pay off. And post your things on Setlist. And what's the other thing? Pay attention to your bandmates. That means always be performing.